Very much indeed, and in fact, uh, we come back perhaps at the best time because we're talking to Head of Strategy at Telcom, uh, Dr. Altman. Uh, perhaps that speaks to you quite a bit. With you, you started telling us a little bit about e-learning and how important that is and how uh, if we don't do it, we're just going to get left behind. Uh, can I, you can finish your thoughts and also perhaps yeah. just add to what we've just seen. Yeah. Well, as Leanne says, technology is quite important, but on its own, it's not an answer. Uh, certainly mobile and online learning is going to be and can be transformative of the education process. Uh, it, it isn't actually, some people might think it's too high tech for an African context. It's absolutely appropriate. I think it's going to be one of the key ways of shortening the distances and reducing marginalization. The problem is, is that the way the pro programs are designed now, and that's true globally, is that they tend to be very technology oriented and they need to be focused on the education outcome and the teaching methodology. And it, 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 there's an additional learning possibility here, which is that kids get very excited about learning. Uh, and they're, they're, it opens up a whole new vista of learning methodologies online that kids in groups or by themselves can uh, be learning mm -hmm. through. They can start reading more, they can start doing more math problems. Mm -hmm. in, in a gaming kind of experience, far more research is required to understand how to hook up access in the school, you know, with the lines hooked up, with the cloud-based services, with the end-user devices like a phone or a tablet or a laptop, but the reality is that we don't know a lot ab yet about how to ensure that we fix education outcomes as a result of that access. And I think that's really the next frontier. Telcom's involved in an experiment right now, or a project right now, with the Department of Communications and the Department of Basic Education to roll out to 600... 1,651 schools, and I think it's going, and, and it's an end-to-end -end solution. So it starts with the lines, it offers a cloud infrastructure, hooks up the classrooms, um, has uh, tablets provided, but what I'm, what I'm really wanting to see through this is how learning outcomes might have changed as a result of this program. We're going to be very focused on that. All right, Dr. Altman, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. Minister, a lot uh, that you need to kind of address. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm interested also, just at the back of this, e-learning. It's a great idea, as uh, Dr. Altman was saying. It's not uh, an answer in itself, but certainly can be a useful instrument. But some people might be saying, even now, that, look, you know, this is great, but <laughs> let's just get to the very basics now and just build schools and get furniture in there, just the basics, even before we even uh, um, say, look, we've got all this the, the ICTs and so on and so forth. Because it, it might suggest that some people are getting even further ahead and others are getting even further left behind. So your thoughts on that and also some of these other questions that are being put through, uh, we'll, we'll put them through to you one by one. No, you're quite right, Peter, that there are basics, and I think we're all agreed that there are basics, and that's why we keep on hammering on the three T's, that to get the right teacher in front of the right class, it's very important to get the right text being utilized and people trained, so the three T's, and also using the time that we have. So we have bottom lines that we know, even under a tree, those have to be there. But I'm saying to enhance also those bottom lines, kids must be comfortable, they must feel safe, they <coughs> really safe from teachers, from the environment, but also they are good enablers like ICTs, which build on those uh, bottom lines. So we're quite agreed that there are bottom lines, but there are enhancers that need to be there. And they are staged, <coughs> they are staged in different sequence, sequences. Peter, if you may allow me, because I, I can tell you, when I was preparing to come, I knew it was going to come, the 30% pass mark. And I thought I should really, first, we always issue technical reports in our system in terms of what are the requirements, what have been the requirements, because the 30% has been bandied around. And I think, I don't know where, where it comes from, but let me just quickly read for, for the record what the past requirements are. I also wrote an opinion piece yesterday in the papers to also clarify the past requirements. In the past five years, we've improved our past requirements. Previously, you had your higher grade or your, your, your past higher grade, which minimum was 40%. We have your standard grade, minimum pass was 33.3%. We have a converted pass rate, which was 25%. 
And my predecessor, Minister Pando, improved the pass rates, and now the current requirements don't work on averages. So the 30% average is not, they were not working on averages. We were working on a, on a set of, of, of subjects. For instance, to pass in a bachelor, you need four subjects at least at 50% to have a, a bachelor's pass. So there's no 50, there's no 30% requirement. And in that category, we have thousands of distinctions that come from that area. So there's no average. To get a diploma, because now we have four categories. To get a diploma pass, which takes you to technical, you must have a 40% in four subjects, which is what was higher grade. So we've improved also. So there's 40% in four subjects to get a diploma. For higher certificate, you at least need two subjects at 40%, then you can get lower. So there's no average at all. So the 30% average is not there. It's a group of subjects. We're presenting seven subjects, unlike when we were presenting six subjects. So there's more subjects to present now, and we are not working on averages. So these are the past requirements. But I think for more information, if you go to our website, we have technical reports about what the past requirements are, school by school, subject by subject. So you can get the, the, the true information. So the 30% that is being bandied around is unfortunate. Because but it's why, why isn't it just 50% for all subjects, all the time, forever? No, but what you need to do, also you have to benchmark yourself. So it's not what you want to I mean, you could say why in any institution, if not university, don't pass more than four subjects a year to go to the second grade. Mm -hmm. So on seven subjects, you say they must pass all seven subjects at 50%. Some kids do, they write up to nine subjects. But we are dealing with kids with different abilities, which have to be accommodated in the system. So if a kid can present 10 subjects, 80 percent, there's no, we celebrate that. If you, some even present nine subjects, we celebrate that. But we are saying to get a, 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 a bachelor's, give us at least four subjects. Mm. Even universities don't ask for more than four subjects a year. And we say four subjects at 50 percent. And we just think it's adequate. But I think to close the debate, there are different views now. Rather than do it emotionally, let's check ourselves against the world, let's benchmark ourselves, let's say what is real for matriculants, what is possible, rather than banding it, it falsely the way it's being done, which is where I have a problem. Let's not bend it around falsely. They, 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 they are in the public domain, they are on our websites, there's mm. official information about what the past requirements are. What I'm just correcting is that people should not right. tell untruths about uh, uh, okay. the past requirements. Can, can, can we say then, with the way the system is set up, that the students that are coming through the basic education system are going to be adequately prepared to get into any university around the world. Are we sufficiently benchmarked uh, to have, I mean, obviously some schools, yes, you know, your, your, your Ivy League schools, et cetera, et cetera, have got different standards, but as a minimum that they should come through the system with the adequate preparation, with the way that it's set up now? They've always been, it's, and it's never been any better. It's actually better than it was yesterday. So they've always been, so there's nothing which will suddenly mm -hmm. bar them from being able to perform at, at any level. So there's nothing new. Instead, Minister Pandu had upped also the, 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 the requirements. requirements. So they've always been, and they'll continue to be admitted anywhere in the world. Okay. I, Dr. Altman? Yeah, I'd just like to correct uh, an impression that might be created, which is that most people in any country don't go to university. Mm. Sure. Uh, so you, you wouldn't expect more than, I, I stand to be corrected, but more than maybe 15% or 20% mm. at most okay. to be going into university. So what most people do is hopefully they can learn a trade. All right. they, they would be able they to get do, into... They do leave school with a school leaving certificate. So, and, and I guess that the... What people are saying is there's that school leaving certificate of a sufficient standard to say that this person has received an education. That, that's more the question. Do, are they set up for the kind of lifelong learning and the type of work that they might be doing? So even if you're a domestic worker, you should be able to read the um, packaging on, right, uh, right. you know, and you should be able to okay. read a newspaper as a citizen. Mm -hmm. But just to clarify that most people don't go to university. We're, we're, some section needs to be ready, sure. and we find that those people are globally competitive. Yes. 
and then we need to be thinking about education that sets sure, people up sure. for work. Yeah, the def definitely different yeah. streams, FET colleges is another I mean, one. Peter, Pro you raised in, in your comments earlier yeah. the issue of going back to basics and the need yeah. to address the issues. Mm -hmm. We need to recognize that obviously the sec senior secondary schools are an issue, but there is a significant portion of our children in our society that never get to grade 12. Mm. Yeah. That there are a large number of kids right. who do not actually acquire the literacy and mathematics skills they need to succeed at secondary schools. Remember the foundation phase, grade one, grade two, grade three, children learn to read. Once they get to grade four, they need to be using reading to learn. And many of our children at the moment mm. aren't acquiring the basic skills in mathematics and in language to succeed at the upper level of the primary schools. And many of them fail out of the secondary schools because the fundamentals are not in place. Mm. So I think one of the things that has happened in the last five years is there's an increasing recognition that we have fixated on our senior secondary schools, mm. on our metric results, and haven't concentrated on the there. real issues, mm. which affects the lives of particularly our most marginalized, and mm. we need to address that because that's going to create real opportunities yeah. for children going mm. forward. Okay. Yeah. You wanted a quick comment, and then I'll get well, ministers to start answering your questions from the floor. I mean, I think this whole debate around whether the, the, the 30 level for yeah. the very lowest possible pass is, 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 is right is, is a bit of a fruitless uh, debate. Mm. Um, because, I mean, we all know that employers and higher education institutions, mm. they don't take a 30 pass seriously. They do require higher levels, and, and the certificates do provide enough information. It would be a problem if learners in our schools are looking at that 30 and saying, if I can only get there, that's enough. But if you look at the distributions of marks, that's not the way learners are thinking. Mm. Uh, the learners know that they need to go way beyond 30, and they try as hard as they can. And as Brahm was saying, the challenge is to ensure that, that learners can go as far beyond the 30 as possible. Mm. All right. Okay, Minister, we're going to have to go to our floor and to our tweets. The first one, can we ban teachers smoking at school? <laughs> <laughs> You can't treat them like as I think you don't treat you can't treat teachers as children. What you can do, I think, because we've not I've not given it a thought, you must have maybe smoking designated smoking areas so that you also re recognize that they are they're adults, they have to be treated as adults, so you can't just say you don't smoke. Yes indeed, if I had my way I would say schools should be no smoking area. But I think teachers are, are adults are professionals. We would rather say schools must have smoking areas and not teachers smoking yeah. out in the open in front of the kids. And I think uh, uh, the, sec the mm -hmm. system can appreciate that rather than banning it completely from, from the school. Okay, the other teacher, the other question is uh, we're hoping to keep our viewer because he says that if he, <laughs> Limpopo is not addressed, he's going to switch off. But I think it does speak <laughs> to a larger question. Um, and I put this to the Minister of Health as well because I, I don't know, maybe I'm just looking at things simplistically, but there are some things that have a national priority, and I think health, education, certainly uh, two of those, and policing. But is there not an argument that the national department runs education throughout? Because if you are born in the wrong province, you are going to have literally a future that's dependent on the ability of the province to provide education. And some provinces we know are succeeding better than others. That's why we're getting this migration of, of families and students pouring into Gauteng or Western Cape, wherever it is, moving away from other provinces. And until it's uniform across the country, um, this level of education, we may continue to see these problems. Shouldn't you take charge and say to the provinces, thank you very much, but I've got to take charge now before it's today. You know, Peter, there are arguments for or against. Yeah. And maybe it's that I started off in the province. There's great value in having provinces with enough powers to be creative, to be innovative, and learning from each other. I mean, if you look at innovations that come from Houghton, Western Cape, and other provinces, the Free State, you can really appreciate the energy that comes from a very it, it diversifies the system because you get lots of creativity, creativity and energy. But as you said, there's a spin to it all, which also 
as you correctly say, disadvantage other kids. If you come from Limpopo, you come from the Eastern Cape, you really are in a twist in the sense that the province or the sector itself is not working as efficient as possible. So what is important for me is to get, get strike, strike the balance. And through the CEM, that's where we try to strike the balance, learn from each other, have norms and standards, and have re really keep the two together. But I really don't subscribe to a system where it's one central system because it doesn't mean that national is, by if it's national, then it's automatically efficient. You get lots of good energy and good. But you uh, get it uh, standardised uh, at least, though. So there are norms and standards, and but as I say, if the province is not functioning, if there are those norms and standards, mm. because at the end of the day, even if you have a, you have a national central government, you still rely on your foot soldiers in the provinces. And there are dynamics, in, especially in provinces like Eastern Cape, the province is vast. The, the settlements are just quite mm. problematic. We've got small schools that disperse. So there are also difficulties in working, especially in Eastern Cape, in terms of settlement, let alone other mm. uh, challenges. But you're quite right that it's just quite sad that if you happen to be in the other province, you are in a difficulty. But yeah. I wouldn't want to also lose. I, I, I don't think the government should lose the energy, the creativity, the innovation that comes also from decentralized powers that come through provincial departments. All right. OK, let's go to table 20. Ravi Pile uh, with Nestle. Ravi, table 20. And if Hi, you good could morning. Be, can you stand up and be brief with your question, and I'm going to get brief answers from our delegates. Sure. Uh, the question is addressed to Minister and the panel. Uh, collective shared action is the, almost the only way today to address development challenges uh, in the South African context. Um, I know we have a partnership with the Department of Basic Education on Nutrition, but is there a concerted plan to try and organize private sector, NGOs, and the department to bring about uh, more efficient and effective interventions in the next few years. Thank you. OK, so PPPs. Who wants to comment on that? Uh, Minister, perhaps you can start and then I get a couple of comments from uh, the others. And also, a, a number of corporates do contribute to this whole education uh, system and, and, and the, some of the challenges there. And I wonder if there's a, is a, it's a coordination of efforts because there's a lot of people doing a lot of different things and maybe this, there should be a way to, to, to pull all of this energy together. No, there is. And I'm really pinning up all my hopes on this collaboration framework that we launched in July, whereby you had the private sector, ourselves as government and NGOs coming together. It was launched by the Deputy President, and it attempts at all that so that we pull all our resources together as a country. It, it has done lots of work, quite exciting work. We should be able to report progress. What it did, amongst other things which had not done, what it's currently doing, they have profiled through that collaboration districts, went to Vembe school by school, district by district, class by class, and say, what are the problems from a broken window to an effective classroom practice, when ineffective school management, to then work with us again, working as working, us working collab, coll collaboratively to make sure that indeed we can deal with it. So there is this framework which will be able, able to report progress. It exactly does the things that is, or it intends mm -hmm. to do exactly the things that he is saying. It has patrons, it's patron, it's Bobby Godsell and uh, Mutazi. It has very strong uh, 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 trustees from the private sector, Aaron Rensbeck representing universities, Sizwe Masani, the, the business corporate, myself representing government. You have your teacher unions also sitting on that collaboration to pull together all our resources and all our energies. And as I said, we should be able to give results now, but we launched it in July, and its intention is exactly to do what uh, is being said. And it, it is part of the implementation of the NDP, because it came from the NDP. Mm -hmm. It's one of the pillars that okay. we should be looking at to improve education. All right. A quick comment from either one of you? Sure. Yeah. I think that it's a very important part of the change process. I think we need to recognize that there are some pitfalls in the process. One is that it often means very disparate strategies. So uh, one NGO or one private sector be supporting a school in one particular thing. And I think we need to be sure that we have alignment and coherence in a strategy. Otherwise, 
the schools already are overwhelmed with so many different kinds of interventions. We need to make sure that everything that is in place is focusing on what we consider to be the really core priorities for our, our school system. The second, and I think it goes more broadly to our interventions, we need to be making sure that all policies and programs that are put in place are evidence-based or at least evidence-informed. Uh, I think we've had many innovations in the past that have been well-intentioned, but were not necessarily mm -hmm. suited to our school system. And Curriculum 2005 is widely acknowledged as never yeah. been really suitable for South Africa, and we've moved away from it. I think there's a need now to put a great deal more emphasis on small-scale pilots and then more rigorous trials before we spend extensive amount of time and we try things mm. at scale that aren't necessarily successful. Mm. So that's the next challenge. And I think the private sector certainly has a very important role to play to support research, to support rigorous empirical evidence to ensure that all policy development or program development is evidence-based. Mm. All right, let's go to uh, uh, JC Engelbrecht now. Some of you may recognize this face. <laughs> as the man who tells us what our weather is going to be like each night. But what you may not know is that his, he's an educator, uh, and in fact, principal at Abbott's College. J.C. Engelbrecht, which table are you on? You didn't say on your piece of paper here. All right, there we go. So what is the weather going to be like today? <laughs> it's quite wet outside, and it's going to stay that way for the next 24 hours. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, my question directed uh, to the minister and, uh, and to the panel, and, and fortunately throughout the discussion already this morning, some of my questions have been answered, but I still just want to get some clarity. Uh, I, th I think we all agree that technology must and will in future play a very important role in, in education in South Africa. Um, I come from a, a situation uh, in, 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 and a background in private education, and, and, and we've done a lot of research and a lot of work on, on the development of, of policies and technologies. And it is a problematic area. Uh, teacher training, how to implement that, it's not just replacing a textbook with a tablet. Those are some of the lessons we've learned. But it, I, I almost feel as if we haven't learned from our mistakes. Um, in March this year, it was announced that the, the Cloud Seed project, uh, Gauteng Online, that was estimated 2 billion rand, was scrapped not after another billion has been spent to implement that. Uh, and if we just take the district where I'm active, less than half of those uh, 1,600 labs that's been built, 25 computers per lab is still active and actually functioning. Um, hardware and, and software upgrades are not, are not being taken care of. So uh, it, it's not really working. And suddenly we are spending uh, another more than half a billion on, on 85,000 tablets just pouring them into schools. My question is, how are we going to monitor those security-wise? Uh, are we not actually putting technology into the hands of teachers that's not capable of dealing with that? And then uh, more importantly, how are we going to, if you don't have a teacher that can deal with the technology, and this is supposed to be implemented by January 2014, um, how, how are we going to deal with these challenges effectively? Once again, the big question of how do we justify this these kind of money, this kind of money being spent while we're still sitting with provinces that's been, uh, that's, that's been mentioned and schools that don't even have the basic, basic infrastructure in place. Mm. Okay, Minister first, then perhaps Dr. Altman. No, I quite agree with Mr. Engel, but in terms of the challenges with technology from crime, I mean, when I was MIT, the biggest nightmare was just secure, before even using them, securing those ICTs in township, lots of breakages with that. So it is a major problem. And all the things that he's spelling out as challenges in terms of using ICTs. And I'm also a very conser maybe conservative teacher to say, you don't move too fast into what you don't know. At least we know good text work, a good teacher works, and using time works. So we keep those and then use ICTs as enhancers, not as the, uh, so that we don't project ICTs as if they are the only solution that is there. So I agree with you that it's a very careful transition. I've visited different countries also. We're trying to move into technology, and you're quite right. It's not like if you move into technology, hurrah, everything gets sorted out. Mm. And about the expenditures, maybe if I could, maybe it's bad from that, because uh, I, don't, I, I really don't want to get into the two billion, one billion, because it's the provincial budgets that are there. The other challenge with the fragmentation of the system, 
provinces get given budgets per learner. And if the more learners you have, the more money you get, and therefore the more facilities are able to get. So the money that is earmarked for Gauteng becomes for, it, 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 it's money for, for, for Gauteng. It can't go to the Eastern Cape. So the less learners we have, the less money we have, and unfortunately those provinces, you find that they have challenges. So it's difficult to say you can't have this in Gauteng because there's no infrastructure in the Eastern Cape. It's a different debate. That's why as national, we've decided to, to allocate resources from the national fiscals to assist those provinces, Limpopo, Eastern Cape, KZN, and other provinces from their budget so that you don't compare the expenditure in Gauteng to the expenditure in Western Cape as if it's from the same, I think the way the system, from the same pocket, if I have to say. So Gauteng will continue, in particular Gauteng, because of its density, will continue to have, I think, a, a, a healthy budget because it has more learners. And that's why as a national, even the rolling out the partnerships with Telcom and them is to crowd them and take them to provinces which are disadvantaged. But I agree with you that ICTs, we have to be very careful in the way we handle them. We have to be very careful in how we transit into ICTs. But what we also can't do is to deny our kids to be part of this, world, this exciting world of technology. Because on the other hand, we have proven evidence that kids who go into ICTs effectively and efficiently improve their, their, their learning. Just as a last word, I mean, the Eastern Cape, when we build new schools, we train teachers on ICTs, we roll out ICTs. When I visited some of those schools, kids by July had done almost 60% of the curriculum, so 80% so of the curriculum. So they're likely to finish much more quicker and much more faster when teachers are able to use ICTs and when also assessing they are properly integrated in their system. So they have lots of value, but you are, are quite correct that it has to be managed quite well so that we really don't go into another big problem and leave out what we know for what we really uh, are still experimenting with. Dr. Alton. Yeah, I, I just wanted to agree. I think anyone who thinks that ICT is going to be a savior and that's often how it's sold, it's just wrong. At the end of the day, uh, it's people who are going to change things. And I, I agree with the minister, you know, people tend not to move, and it's big institutions like government, tend not to move in huge leaps, they tend to move in steps. So ICT is critical, again, I was saying earlier, both because we need the population e-enabled as a critical area, but secondly, because it could be an education enabler and also a way of monitoring the school system. The, the problem is, is that these, these programs tend to be designed as technology solutions. Let's stick a lab in the school. Let's connect the school up. That's not the answer. The answer, yes, will be to hook them up, have mm -hmm. equipment. But which equipment, which teaching methodology, how do we enliven both the teachers and the students now to be mm -hmm. practicing, teaching, using these materials, uh, that issue of evidence-based uh, design, which is why we're, we're looking at really strengthening the evidence base yeah. around the 1600 Schools Project, is yeah. absolutely critical to working out how do you now infuse this new technology into an environment so that the people yeah. find it interesting, compelling, want to protect the equipment, engage with it, that the kids love it, that it, they read more uh, because of things like Project Yoza, uh, that they are doing math equations because it's fun. Yeah. That's what we've got to get to and, and work out. And that is where the research and thinking is very, very weak and needs to be strengthened. Mm -hmm. But I think we have an opportunity now in partnership mm -hmm. to be building that up. I also just wanted to come back to the partnership story because I have two experiences. I know that in the past period of years there's been a great frustration between the private sector and the public sector in, in working together. And I would say, you know, I, I chair the Tiger Brands Foundation where we work very closely with the Ministry of Education. Uh, and the program rolled out very quickly from, it, it's a, it's a, a breakfast feed feeding program that was an experiment to complement the National School Nutrition Program, and it rolled out very, very quickly over a very short period of time to reach about 40,000 children in two years, and that was only because, not only because, but in large part because of, of, of a very close partnership. Mm -hmm. And equally at Telcom, we have a very close mm -hmm. relationship and growing one. So I have to commend the department in, in really opening up and engaging. The key thing is to make sure that these programs are well designed and fit with the system. 
right. we're not all thinking we're the top education experts. because everybody yeah. knows how to fix education. It's one of those things. Mm -hmm. Not everybody thinks they know how to roll out broadband, but everybody knows how to fix education, and it creates a lot of little projects okay. that don't go anywhere. All right. Um, yes, I was going to come to you, actually, um, because you're awfully quiet at the corner there. <laughs> Um, you, you can comment, but also if you could just address, because I think one of the key things that's coming through here is that a lot of people are quite happy with the curriculum as it's been set, that it's a quality one, but actually it takes educators to work it. And so are we giving enough support to our teachers? Are we providing with them with enough resources? And how do we stop the hemorrhaging that we're seeing of teachers coming out of the system? and becoming something else in commerce and industry, whereas we've got these people there that really have the knowledge, but for one reason or another are leaving. I think we lost 6,000 teachers last year or something like that. So that, I think, is a critical issue that we need to address. Yeah, I, I think that, that w the, the ICT and education experts at UNESCO and places like that say what's absolutely crucial is that you need a, a very good national policy uh, a good policy framework for these various partnerships and uh, developments in ICT to, to, to occur. We, we, in South Africa, we're sitting with the 2005 white paper on uh, uh, e-education, mm -hmm. and there is a process currently to develop a new policy. I think a gap that we do still sit with is an insufficient uh, policy uh, framework for, for this work. Um, on another thing the, the UNESCO guys say is that if you want to move ahead with ICT in education, uh, you have to have teachers on board. Uh, teachers have to be passionate and knowledgeable about the technologies. Um, and certainly, I mean, one way of, of valuing teachers more, keeping them in the system, is uh, to, for instance, use uh, initiatives such as the Teacher Laptop Initiative to uh, give teachers resources, get them excited, and to use those technologies to develop uh, teachers mm. through, through e-based in-service training. Okay, Angela Dick is on table number five. Um, Angela? Thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid, Minister, I'm one of the guilty parties. I deserted the teaching profession some years ago, <laughs> and I used to train teachers as well as a lecturer. I've been in business for about 30 years, and my job is to find employment for South Africans. So, in the past 30 years, we've probably placed about 2 million South Africans in employment. But my point is this. What is the minister doing about ensuring that our children, even at the basic primary level, understand what kind of job opportunities are available to them so they can get guidance in terms of selecting their subjects and become a useful member of our society? Thank you. Minister? Yeah. That different programs that we have in place, Peter, to, for instance, in your life orientation program to expose kids to different career opportunities to assist them to make choices for, for, for the future, helping them select subjects when they're in grade nine. But I can still say, looking at what happens at the end of even grade 12, when kids still don't know what they want to do, more can still be done, not only in terms of just informing them, where, where I, I, I see career guidance having succeeded is where even kids have been assessed themselves to get them to understand what they want. Because some of the things that they choose, they choose them. They want to be doctors because they're intelligent. But when they have to go to the profession, perhaps that's not what they want to do. And that's why you'll find doctors leaving the profession to become motivational speakers. So which means they were directed because they, that, that was a glamorous uh, profession for intelligent kids at the time. So what we need to do more, more than just telling them about available careers, but to also help them understand themselves so that they really appreciate the professions that they can, they are cut for despite the, the either level of, of, of intelligence or, or less. I just want to quickly take advantage and just speak mm -hmm. about this teacher attrition rates that indeed, I mean, losing a qualified teacher, I mean, teachers are a gem. And the more experienced they are, the more valuable they become. And losing them, it really is a big problem. But we also have to look at it in the context, in, in the context of attrition rates n n normally. Professions, what, how, I mean, people just, people die, people have interest, people outgrow their jobs in every profession. I mean, in Parliament, we're sitting with lots of doctors and lawyers. Uh, 
It's because people change interests and, and life just determines where people go. We lose the number that you mentioned, uh, Peter, it's about 5.9%. Mm. And what are attrition rates normally for any profession? They range from 5% to 30%. So it's unfortunate that we are in a very important sector where you don't want to lose one teacher to, 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 mm. to, to any sector. But the important fact is it's within the normal ranges of attrition rates for any profession. That's why I said doctors leave professions, engineers leave their professions, everybody leaves their profession, they outgrow their professions. Actually, we have a very stable mm. a, a, a sec, a, 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 a sector in education. At 5.9, means we are very stable mm. in terms of a, a, a attrition rate. It's a very normal rate. It's something normal. It's just unfortunate that we don't, the problems that we don't bring it, enough young mm. people into the profession, it's, but it's not that we are losing too many people okay. out of the profession. The losses that are there are normal. For uh, any other profession. Minister, are we ever going to see College of Educations coming back? Because they seem to have been a good thing and we got rid of them. We've opened two already, if you recall. Okay. We've opened two and there is a, a program to roll them out uh, in, in their numbers. And the biggest problem we have more than anything, because universities are producing enough teachers for us for secondary schools. So foundation phase teachers where indeed we don't have enough foundation phase uh, teachers, and we, it's, it's, it's a cohort of the profession that is aging much more quicker, and that's where we have to quickly uh, 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 find the solution to, to stop the, the, the bleed, but also to attract more young people in the foundation phase, you know, ECD programs, and that's what we have asked higher education to prioritize in terms of the reopening of colleges, to assist us to recruit more learners for your foundation phase and continue with universities producing a, your, your, okay. Teachers for, 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 for universities, for, right. for senior phases. Table four, Senzo Boteles. Thank you very much. Uh, my question um, is uh, based on uh, the sanitation problems. A significant number of schools um, in, in, in informal settlements and uh, uh, rural areas uh, are but basically day to day faced with the problem of sanitation, you know. Um, so I'd like to know from the minister, uh, what is being done? What is the future, you know, uh, program to alleviate uh, the, that current issue? Thank you. Okay. So the government has prioritized what we call basic facilities, which is your sanitation, water, electricity, and fencing. And we are rolling out a, 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 on an ongoing basis, a program. So, I, I mean, if you go to our website, you get the statistics of how many schools we fence, how many are still outstanding. As you correctly say that, especially in your form, informal settlement, it's a moving target because those arise overnight, so it means you have a new need overnight. But there is a plan that is supposed to be complete. It was supposed to be complete by 2014, but we are not sure that we'll be able to finalize it by 2014 fully. We have requested cabinet to allow us another year because it is a moving target with new settlements coming into the fall. But we have a clear program. We have a budget also, which is run also nationally to chase the target of sanitation, water, electricity, and fencing. We've added also school furniture as one of the key basic, basic facilities that uh, 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 needs that are there in our school. So we have a plan and it, it is rolling out and we have budgets for it. Table one, Maureen Magubane. Uh, morning, Mo Minister. I'm Maureen Makubane, the President of Rural Women in Agriculture. Uh, our concern as rural women is that uh, in rural areas, education, the pass rate is very poor. So we've got a special request f uh, from you, Minister, if you can help the rural area, uh, area schools uh, with nutrition, like uh, we've seen in KZN, the rural women are, are the ones who are doing the school nutrition in the province, and we've seen the different in pass rate. Now, can you, Minister, do the, uh, do the nutrition in all the provinces that the rural women are doing the school nutrition? And also, the other thing is the, the, that our request is you can give the sanitary towels to the girls at, at rural areas. Uh, because we can see that the girls in the rural areas, they get absent for maybe about seven days without going to school because of the 
menstruation period. So can you put it in the policy or wherever with the government that the government supply the sanitary towels to the schools? I thank you. Okay. Oh, you <laughs> no, rural areas are a priority. The program, for instance, that Dr. is talking about, that in addition to the school nutrition that we do, I mean, the state spends more than five billion a year just on school nutrition, and rural areas do get that. And what they found through the Tiger, uh, Tiger Brand Foundation that you even need to provide breakfast. And the schools we're visiting with here, schools in deep, deep, deep rural Eastern Cape, to really focus our energies on rural areas. So most of our programs or our package is pro poor it's in terms of transport, in terms of school nutrition, even our school, our infrastructure program is focusing and prioritizing rural areas. The question about sanitary towels, uh, I think it's a debate that we're having with the Department of Health to say in whose budget this will come from because for me to provide sanitary, means I need to have a budget for it. Just on school nutrition, as I say, we spend almost five billion, which weighs very heavily on our, on our budget. And people always say education department has a huge budget, but there are no outcomes. But if you look at our budget, our budget pays salaries and do everything else, and very little that is left for curriculum work, which is what we are also pitching for uh, as, as the department to treasure. So I'm not ruling out that we'll give center uh, towns, but I really can't sit and commit honestly and say, yes, indeed, we're going to look at it. So it depends whether we are mm. getting budgets. So we're speaking to, with the Minister of Health to say from whose, from, from whose budget should that come from. But it is a matter which is on the table and it's being discussed. But I don't have concrete okay. commitments that I can say to say, yes, indeed, from 2014, we'll roll it out because it's just not right. in our plans. Here's one question. I mean, it's can been it? in the news quite a bit recently. And this, you know, in the National Teachers Union Conference called for armed guards at schools because they complain of verbal and physical abuse from students. What has happened that kids think it's okay to hit teachers. I, don't, I mean, when I was at school, I was scared <laughs> of my teachers. What has, what has happened that we've got to this point? And I can't believe that a child wakes up one morning and decides today's the day I'm gonna beat my geography teacher. There must be a process of failures in the system for that to have happened one day, uh, uh, interventions that could have happened before in that child's life. And I think we're quite quick to blame the parents. They could be part of the equation. But I think the school system also must have picked up some behavior in that child along the way. That one day for him to be chasing a teacher with a broom is just shocking to me. Uh, Brown? Peter. I, I think we need to address that issue. It's clearly a very important issue and it's a national concern. But I want to go back to the nutritional concerns yeah. because I think often the experiences of poor children, particularly in rural areas, don't often come to the fore. They're mm. not in the national limelight. They don't become part of a viral YouTube video. And so we focus on things that are in the public domain that we see very viscerally. And I think that the, I'm so pleased that somebody here highlights a central issue related to nutrition. Mm. But the nutrition issues are complex. There are clearly a whole lot of nutritional issues that affect learners' capacity to value or get value out of the school system that happen way before the children ever get to school. So we know that there is a substantial proportion of children who are stunted between the ages of one and six. We need to be focusing on, and I think there is substantial work the Department of Health, Department of Social Development are focusing on nutrition and appropriate tradition, nutrition for young children. And that's a crucial bedrock issue that needs to be addressed for children to benefit from learning. But there are also issues related to micronutrient deficiencies. So even if children are getting a balanced uh, meal in a, a school feeding scheme, there are often nutritional deficits that children have that do affect their capacity mm -hmm. to concentrate, to benefit from the schooling process. And there's a growing body of research that links, for example, something called hidden hunger. We have not just a problem of children who don't have enough protein or not enough uh, calories, but they're often coming to school early and don't have a breakfast. Mm -hmm or that they're hungry over the school holidays. So we need to understand that nutrition, 
which is a thing that Key affects the vast majority of children, in some sense much more significant than a viral YouTube. These are the national concerns that really need to be privileged and need to All be right. focused on in our national debate. Okay, that is fair enough, but the teachers conference says they're getting verbal and physical abuse all the time, not just the ones that we're seeing on TV. If they need armed guards to teach, what's gone wrong, Minister? It's an exaggeration, Pete. I, I just one incident of violence, it's one too many. So I shouldn't underestimate the importance of us dealing with violence. But there are almost more than 12 million kids in the system. And I can assure you, Peter, the majority of our kids still revere and respect teachers. I visit schools, 99% of our kids still respect teachers. You have one incident, yes, it's one too many. The problem of violence for me in schools is actually bullying, where learners amongst themselves have this secret violence. And that's, for me, much more serious. And it's not violence that you deal with through security guards, you deal it with much more deeper interventions in terms of socializing. I mean, that kid with that viral uh, 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 YouTube, I'm surprised that you say we blame parents too, too much. Kids are, in most instances, are a symbol of what they, where, where they come from. You can see a child's home by the time they walk through the door. So homes are very important in terms of socializing and preparing kids for schools. So I really don't think you can exempt parents that much and say, we're supposed to have picked it up. Maybe the reason the teacher grabbed that back from him is because it is a problem child. And I was trying to deal exactly with what we're saying so that he doesn't go even beyond where he is. So schools are a, also a, 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 a little world of, of what our world is. We, we, we come from a very violent society. And that we can't underestimate. And it does spill over uh, into our schools. But the bottom line is that kids still respect, revere uh, educators, and they're quite beautiful. I mean, so we don't have a schools. problem? No, one is one too many. I can't say an incident of violence is nothing. It's one is one too many. But I'm saying if we look at within the context, where I, had, where I have an issue with you, say we can't blame parents. And I'm saying it's homes that have to help us a lot in preparing our kids for schools. Because we're dealing with 50 kids, and your function is to teach homes have a chance, they're not okay. teaching, they're socializing. All so right. let them do most of their work, then we'll do the teaching. Okay, we're running out of time, so let me try and get as many through, through as many as questions as possible. But if you could be brief with your questions, and I'll get brief answers for you. Hassan, table 12. Hassan, table 12. Minister. Yeah, speak. Uh, Minister, my question to you is the current curriculum, does it give creative thinking to the learner and the educator? Thank you. Yeah. Peter, because I leave that curriculum, and I must say I'm deeply in love with that curriculum, I'd rather ask people who really work with us, maybe if Bram can comment on it, because it will be quite biased, because personally I think we've done a good job with the curriculum. We've also assessed satisfaction rate amongst educators, and more than 90% of them think we're on the right track. We've developed it not only as a department with experts, both local and, uh, 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 and international. So I think we, did, we invested lots of energy into getting it right. But maybe Bram, who's not the minister, can assess us and say, or anybody else, but I, I'm very comfortable with the curriculum. All right. Bram, creative thinkers, innovators of the future. I need, we need to recognize that the curriculum is a framework, but ultimately what happens in schools is determines whether the curriculum is going to be creative or not. So I think the framework has been put in place, it has been expanded, there's a much greater variety of themes that are in the curriculum from grade one through grade 12, but it all depends on the capacity of teachers to realize the full potential of the curriculum. So I think that's the thing we need to be thinking about, is about what our teachers are able to do and how they're able to animate the curriculum in ways that really encourages children, encourage children to think critically, independently, and really encourages them to become creative individuals. Minister, uh, trade unions in education, are they a problem? Because we're seeing a lot of strikes and our kids not getting an education. I wouldn't say they're a problem. They're a very useful partner, I must say. Um, most of the achievements that we can claim in the education department, we did in partnership with teacher unions. 
when we are revising the curriculum, we worked very close with teacher unions. They got their members on panels and enabled us to go and pilot the, the, the curriculum in schools. So there's quite a number of very good things that we do with teacher unions, and we have a very healthy relationship. But at the end of the day, teachers are also workers. They have issues, which are issues of employing an employee. And the unfortunate thing about education is that it's a very sensitive area where we are modeling and socializing kids. And some of the things which are normal in the normal world are difficult to handle in the teaching profession. When teachers go on strike, you can imagine going on strike where you have learners who are blind. So those teachers have got rights, constitutional rights, which allow them to, to, go, to go on strike. On the other hand, we have a very sensitive area. We have blind kids who will be at risk if you have to leave them. So it's, it's a sector which is very sensitive to what is normal in the normal world. But we have a very good uh, relationship with most of our teacher unions, and they really are quite committed in, uh, in assisting and uh, working with government mm. to make the sector work and be successful. So they're not a problem, I say. It's just that the sector is very sensitive to some of the things which are normal. Very last question to Busi Siwe Matlang, with Table 12. Busi Siwe. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you clearly have powers beyond the normal. <laughs> Do you understand that? Uh, thank you. A Honourable very quick Minister. with your question, hey? Okay. Um, nothing has been said about special schools and learners with disabilities. What is the Minister's programs on people with intellectual disabilities? Okay, very quick answer, Minister. Yeah, we declared 2013 the year for inclusive education, and we've done quite a number of things to improve in that sector because, indeed, that's one sector that we really had neglected to a very large extent. In my speech, I did mention that we've braided uh, our workbooks. That for the first time, we're giving blind kids their certificates in, in a braille text, which is something which had never happened. So, uh, quite a number of programs we've really looked at. We are training teachers in big numbers around areas of disability. We have finalized the curriculum for sign, South African Sign Language. As I mentioned that we will be, for instance, training more people next year, preparing material and rolling it out. I also spoke about differentiated teaching, which I think is a major issue in our system. Yeah. And that's what came from appeals uh, uh, results to say, the other thing which keeps us back as a sector, we teach at the rate of the slowest. So it's good to have inclusive education, to have kids with different abilities, but we've not factored it into our teaching in terms of our techs, in terms of training our teachers to get them to deal right. adequately with children of different, with different uh, abilities. So we have issued out, is it, uh, we, 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 we've written a, 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 a concept paper yeah. on that because we think it's a major area, especially kids with learning disabilities, okay. because they just disappear in the midst of everything else, and that's one area we're up in. Well, well, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, because yeah. these things can go on, especially a subject such, such as this, but we've run out of time, and we're going to have to leave it there. So, ladies and gentlemen, Minister of Basic Education, Angie Motseka, uh, Miriam Altman, Head of Strategy, Telcom, Bram Fleisch, Witt School of Education, and Martin Gustafsson, Department of Economics at uh, Stellenbosch University. Thank you very much for joining us uh, and sharing your thoughts with us on this very important issue, education in South Africa. Thank you for your time. And thank you to the audience here as well, and you at home. Have a great day, everybody, and uh, please join us again tomorrow morning, bright and early, for more of the same. Have a great day.